Hi, everybody, and welcome to another episode of What in the World is Happening. We are here every week, every Saturday, to talk about Maitreya and the Masters of Wisdom and their impact on the world and how it's changing everything for all of us. Uh, we broadcast live on Zoom, on Facebook Live, YouTube, and Twitch. And uh, my name is Sabina Qureshi. I'm here in Edmonton, Alberta, Canada. And with me today is Yvonne Lewis, who's in Chicago, the USA. Hi, Hi. Yvonne. Hi, Sabina. Thank you for having me today. It's great to have you on the show, and I'm very excited about our topic. We're going to be talking today about the rising voice of the people. This is something that we're witnessing all around. Uh, it's, it's just an undeniable force. It's a new force in world affairs. <laughs> and uh, we like to think of often as uh, the voice of the people as, as the new superpower, uh, and it's really changing every everything. And that's what we're going to talk about today and how Maitreya's presence and the presence of the masters of wisdom in the world is part of this entire process that we're witnessing. And we like to start out by just telling you a little bit about our source of information when we talk about Maitreya and the masters of wisdom and a brief description of who they are. Benjamin Krem is our main source of information and he was an author and artist who taught this information, gave lectures around the world, and he was in telepathic com communication with one of the masters of wisdom. And he did all of this work uh, absolutely free, and uh, you can easily access his books. They are available online, and four of them are available for free download. Uh, so if you're interested, uh, you can immediately have access to this information. And the books are available on share-ecart.com or share-international.org. And you can also watch videos of Benjamin Krem on the Share International channel on YouTube. And now we're just gonna talk briefly about who are the masters of wisdom. Um, Yvonne, would you like to take that? Yes, I'd like to, Sabina. The masters of wisdom are simply elder brothers, men and women who've gone ahead of us in evolution and turn back to help us reach their level. I sometimes like to think of the head of the group, uh, we'll talk about them later, Maitreya, as a, a revered professor, uh, uh, someone who is there to help you, can't do it for you, but wants to uh, you know, make your progress really substantial. So these masters of wisdom have total mastery over themselves, and that's what mastery, as we speak of it, is all about, and the laws of nature. So they have mastered their physicality, their emotional life, their mental life, and can perform on those levels uh, at a high, uh, at the highest level. And now, and Yvonne, sorry, Yvonne, would you say that they're like our <clears throat> our elder brothers and sisters? They're they're like a, a revered professor, but they're also there's a sense of love and compassion on their part, because they have gone through all of the trials and tribulations that we experience. They have lived like us as normal men and women on this earth, going through everything that people go through. So they know what it is to, to be a human being and to go through difficulties and challenges. So they have great compassion for us and there's no judgment from their point of view. So even though they might be at a higher level of evolution of their consciousness, uh, they don't judge us and they, and they don't see us in any way as less than themselves because they see in us the same potential since they know that we're going to also one day uh, reach that type of mastery over ourselves, that we're all on this path of evolving towards that. And they administer as well the uh, plan of evolution and all the energies entering our planet. So they've returned now to help us achieve their the same perfection, but not um, in a bossy way. So they cannot violate the law of free will, which determines we, they can advise and assist, but we have to do the work in getting ready for the new age. That's right. And what's interesting is that as you talk about them not violating our free will, uh, this is an absolute basic fact of uh, the law, if you want to call it that, of how things work. Uh, 
here on earth, there can be no infringement of that law. Now, of course, we ourselves do infringe it uh, all the time and prob probably very often without realizing it. Uh, so that's part of our growth in evolution is learning how not to do that uh, mm -hmm. and becoming aware enough that we are able not to do that. Now, you talked about Maitreya a bit earlier, and he is called the head of the spiritual hierarchy. But here, when we use the word hierarchy, we don't mean it in the same sense as a corporate structure, for example, where you have a boss who gives orders to people underneath, who then give orders to people underneath. Uh, this type of hierarchy works in a very different way. It's much more like what we would see in nature, where you have an originating source of energy or ideas, which then permeates through a system and lays a kind of groundwork or framework for other sources. So it's, it's much more organic in that sense and fluid. Uh, all of the masters are in telepathic contact with each other all the time. Uh, so they're aware of what each other, they, they can talk to each other all the time and they're working together as a, as a group. Uh, it's all about group for them. Um, and they see us as well as part of a large group, uh, the group called humanity. And all of us are in a process of moving into the same type of awareness that they have. Now, you talked about Maitreya, Yvonne, and the fact that he's sort of like a, an elder brother of the elder brothers. Uh, mm -hmm. And what, in, in fact, does his role involve? How does he play a part? Well, he's one of the um, higher middle managers of this planet in the sense that he embodies love so that uh, as part of the plan of evolution for the entire planet, he has that integrity and uh, he appears, um, you know, uh, here and there. Uh, we'll talk about his appearances at another, uh, 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 another uh, topic for a later show. But he actually, in, 19, in the 70s, I'd say mid-70s, most of the masters of wisdom who you saw in uh, kind of a light body as light. Um, are, are you referring to our previous slide? Yes. Okay. And I'll he, just go back to that for a second. Um, this one here, this picture? Yes. Uh -huh, that picture, I didn't want it to be a puzzling to people to see, oh, well, the, they're not real people. Yes, there are 14 real masters of wisdom and real physical bodies of walking the planet now. And Maitreya as well is in a physical body. So they're behind the scenes at this point, but getting ready to emerge openly in the world. Wait, our, you're saying 14 of them have already emerged into the world, right? And are living in the cities of our world, for example, in London, Tokyo, Madrid, Darjeeling, Geneva, yes. other cities. Now, the, but this photo that you're mentioning, the one where they're, or not photo, this it's an illustration really, where they're in, they look like they're all white. You're just saying that's not how they actually appear now. They, no. they look like regular people. If we met them on the street, they, they would be absolutely indistinguishable from any other person. Correct. They were in retreat for long ages and now they're present physically in the world. So that's a great hope, I think, the first significant hope that there are, there are a staff, as it were, of people who are standing by to assist in all these difficulties we have. And, well, and if, Yvonne, wouldn't you say they're not just standing by, uh, but they're actually actively engaged in helping us? Uh, I'm sorry, I went ahead there. Uh, but because they, even though we're not necessarily talking to them directly now, uh, nevertheless, they are active uh, all the time in helping us, perhaps in ways we're not aware of. Uh, and that's one of the things we're going to talk about today is how this help is permeating our societies and our world and yes. um, helping us, in fact, at this very difficult moment. And I just want to mention now, uh, on this slide, we say that the Lord Maitreya is the world teacher for the next uh, 2,250 years. This refers to the fact that every age has a different uh, world teacher. Now, when we talk about ages here, we're talking about uh, astronomical ages. And so right now we're in a, a changeover from the age of Pisces to the age of Aquarius. And every age has its teacher. So previously, for example, the age of Pisces, uh, the world teacher well, was, was also the Christ, but known as Jesus. This is the figure that everyone is very familiar with. 
And the age prior to that, the age of Aries, the, the teacher was the Buddha and everyone is aware of who the Buddha is as well. And we anticipate that during this coming age, uh, Maitreya will be equally well known. Yes. And can you talk about how, what's the difference between the age of Pisces and the age of Aquarius? Well, for a long time, uh, many of 2000 years is the time length of every age. We were in the age of growing individuality. And so we've gone way beyond the mature individual and have entered an area where the individual um, is not <laughs> working with others, but the individual is all for himself. Now we're moving into a uh, time of cooperation and synthesis where a strong individuals and in all groups on the planet come together and they work together. They care about each other. They feel that every person on the planet is just as important as they are. And that's what the age of Aquarius is all about. When we're moving into the age of Aquarius, there are birth pangs, there is chaos, there is collapse. And we've experienced some of that already. But the outcome is that the energies of Aquarius are like a cosmic magnet. So as they enter more and more, you know, as our solar system moves in front of this great constellation of Aquarius, we will be compelled to consider the uh, principles of the new age. Well, and when you talk about uh, people feeling that every single human being has the same value, that everyone is equally important, I think what we can talk about is that uh, the Declaration of Human Rights was the first time that humanity established this idea uh, officially, internationally, publicly, uh, that we all matter. Everyone has a right simply by virtue of existing. Uh, it's not based on heredity, on property, on race, on religion, or any other particular quality. It's simply a human right. And I think this is something so fundamentally revolutionary. Uh, the ideals have been held for many, many years, millennia even, this ideal of universal love or brotherhood and justice. However, it had never been encapsulated in this way. And I think this is really very important. And it, it really shows that when this was done, uh, and this is after World War II, there was, a, there was a real awakening. And perhaps it was the destruction of the war that al allowed people to be clear enough to see that what is it, what is it that's missing? What is it we're not doing? Uh, and so we see uh, the Declaration of Human Rights as very fundamental to this understanding of some type of universality that uh, you can't argue with. Exactly, and uh, my, I'm skipping ahead again, but Maitreya's priorities are based around, it seems, you know, as though there were synchronicity. These uh, articles that everyone has the right to food, housing, healthcare, education, um, by birth. Mm -hmm. Did we right. talk about these? Yes, we did talk about our principles are sharing, and that creates justice and right relationship, which means you see the other as yourself. Uh, eventually, you know, we're all working on that, but um, it produces love and unity, and going forth together makes everything easier. When there's trust, there can be sharing and love and freedom. Well, and you know, Maitreya actually says that if we share, we will generate that trust, uh, that the step towards creating the trust is sharing, because I'm not sure how to generate trust just out of sort of thin air. I, I don't know how to do that myself. Uh, of course, with spiritual practices, with certain types of training, perhaps uh, different types of psychology, you can, you can generate some kind of trust. But his message really is to say that if you want to create trust, you, you have to share. That's the first step. Um, there is no other way. And so I just wanted to address one thing. We've had a couple of questions about the masters of wisdom. And one of them is about um, the, the next incarnation of Sai Baba, who will be Prema mm -hmm. Sai Baba. Uh, will he be with the masters? Well, Sai Baba is an avatar. That is to say, he's 
he doesn't come out of the Earth's evolution. Uh, so he exists in a different plane, if you want to put it that way, uh, than the masters of wisdom. However, he's, defini he's definitely uh, part of that process of, of helping humanity and the masters of wisdom know him very well and he knows them. Uh, they all work together. Uh, so he's definitely part of that group action to help humanity. Uh, and that's why he's here as well. Every time that he comes, he's here for that purpose. There was one more question about the masters and that was, uh, is there a master living in Madrid? Yes, there is. Uh, and to our knowledge, there is a master in, in each of the following cities. I may not remember all of them, but I know London, uh, New York, Geneva, Darjeeling, Tokyo. Uh, now, I, what else am I missing? Um, Moscow. Moscow, right? And I'm not sure of others. Um, we, we've been told through Benjamin Krem that there are 14 masters living in the world right now, though the list I just that we just gave is not 14 uh, cities long. So we're not, oh, Rome as well, right? Rome. Yeah, uh, the master Jesus is in, in Rome. Uh, his task will be to uh, reform or, or put to rights uh, the, the Catholic Church, um, which is in great need of that. So yes, the masters are definitely living in the in cities and they're experiencing life that the kind of life we know uh, with all of the pollution, all of the noise and the hustle and bustle. And that's also part of their evolution. Uh, that's a step that they're taking in their process of evolution because the evolution of consciousness doesn't stop. There's no end point. You don't reach a moment and say, that's it, I'm done now. Uh, it's, it's constant. Uh, so it's part of their growth as well, uh, to return to living in our world and to work with us in that way. And well, I think what we wanted to do, sorry, Yvonne, you go ahead. I wanted to mention that the, the master in uh, the, the article, The Path to Unity, talks about how the old order seeks in every way to halt the progress of the movement from the Piscean way to the Aquarian way. Uh, but it cannot stand forever, I'm reading from the article, against the principles of life that we've mentioned. The ever-changing, ever-remaking its form to better express the nature of that life. So thus it is today that the old will wither, the old will wither, and the new shoots will flourish as men seek to express and manifest better the principles that we've just talked about sharing justice, right relationship, love, and unity. Well, and what I like about this particular um, passage is that the master, and this is Benjamin Krem's master, when, it, we, when we say the master, uh, that's who we're referring to. We're referring to the master that Benjamin Krem was in telepathic contact with his master. And he says here that the weapons for, for fighting against ignorance and fear are spiritual understanding knowledge and love. And I find that so powerful uh, because it's something that works, maybe it appears to be magically, but there is a, a real a result of understanding. Uh, we use the word light in the, in, in the, in the expression enlightenment to, or yeah. just throw light on the matter. So it's, we already have it in our language that there's, a sense in which when light is thrown on something or when we see something anew or we experience enlightenment, uh, there's increased understanding, increased knowledge. And generally when there's more knowledge and more understanding, then you also have uh, qualities like acceptance, forgiveness, love, and all of these help in, in doing battle with ignorance and fear, uh, which are the main obstacles to seeing each other as one and the same to, to seeing ourselves as part of the same family. And when we're talking about Maitreya's weapons, um, there is in the same message, the son of man, and it, a sentence that says, but never before in the history of the world as a teacher, he comes as a teacher, not as anything else, come better equipped for his task. So it's, a, it's amazing that... Um, it, there is a bulwark behind what we're going to talk about next, the protest movement, which has been the tried and true way of making change. 
That's right. And of course, we know that uh, people have been gathering together to protest uh, peacefully. Civil resistance movements have existed for, for a long time. And we can go back in time and, and count them and see a direct line through time of these movements of people demanding increased justice, uh, for example, the civil rights movement in the United States. Here we're talking about the very recent uh, incarnations of this uh, urge to demand justice, to demand mm -hmm. rights uh, where there have been wrongs. And so most recently in the last decade, we saw the Time for Outrage. This was uh, a pamphlet published by Stefan Hessel, a French uh, resistance fighter uh, at the time of World War II. And he was 93 uh, when this pamphlet was published. And it inspired a movement in Spain called the Indignados or the, or the Outraged Ones, uh, who really, in the end, that movement in Spain became the seeds for new political parties. And uh, a lot of change came about as a result. And it spread into the rest of Europe. Then there was Occupy Wall Street, also in Europe and across the ocean in the United States, Canada, other countries. And then the Arab Spring we saw, uh, enormous changes resulted. Uh, there has been the climate strike most recently, uh, Me Too, the racial justice movements. The movements keep coming. What's interesting is that right now in the world, we're seeing people clamoring for justice in many different arenas uh, simultaneously. So it's not just an isolated occurrence in one place or another. We're seeing this on many fronts uh, across the globe in many countries. And it appears to be something that's unstoppable that just keeps coming. Uh, and and we, we just have to look and see that this is a real movement of change. Uh, it's, it's something that you can't dial it back. Right. And I would say that uh, the, the strength of it uh, relies also in prior early 20th century movements. For instance, women's suffrage in various countries earlier or later. And then uh, there was the movement. Oh, oh, I had another one in mind. But mm -hmm. these earlier groups are the groups on, upon which whose shoulders uh, were all standing in terms of protest movement. Um, I, oh, I was thinking of the uh, labor movement in the 30s was very powerful and very uh, harsh in a way, but it made a big difference for the workers uh, right. in the United States and other uh, countries, I'm sure. So and you can even, sorry, you can even go further back. Uh, the, there was the Baker's protest in, in England a few centuries ago. These movements have been coming for a long time. And I just want to mention the topic of our show is the rising voice of the people. And what we're talking about is how this rising voice of the people is intimately connected with the presence of Maitreya and the masters in the world. Exactly. Um, the voice of the people I just want to mention is in crescendo, uh, even more people. And uh, Benjamin Prem talks about it hundreds of people, then thousands of people, then millions of people protest to governments. The government has uh, got to, to concede. And uh, so that it, it shows you the power of the people. Um, the and fact we, that he, Maitreya is cultivating this voice of the people and making it uh, the voice of the peoples all over the world, supporting it, strengthening it. And all we have to do is follow through with what seems to be the right thing to do. Uh, it's wrong for people to be homeless. It's wrong for people to starve to death in a world of plenty. And so the issue is it's wrong to have people killed for various reasons. So we need to look at these issues and address them. And you wanted to mention that um, the master has specifically said that there is a quality of fearlessness which people mm -hmm. begin to experience uh, when they have understanding and they are united. And I think that's a very important quality because if we look at some of these recent protests uh, around the world, for example, the protests in Myanmar, we have a quote here from an article in The Guardian from back in March, I'm still going to go to the front lines. If I get shot and die, then so be it. I can't stand it anymore. Now this is, you know, in an extreme situation. Uh, hopefully, most of us don't have to experience this. But 
obviously people feel a sense of imminent uh, need, they have to go out and protest, even if the risk is that great. And yeah. more, and also uh, another quote, we are more and we are not afraid. They took away so much, they even took away our fear. This is from the protests in Puerto Rico uh, last fall. So we're seeing that there's a, a growing sense of not just urgency, but the willingness to take risks. Uh, and this is something I think it's quite new. Um, now you talked earlier, Yvonne, about how Maitreya is helping us. Uh, Benjamin Krem has said that Maitreya stimulates this kind of desire to go out and protest, to, to raise your voice, uh, to take action. And he's also said that Maitreya is at every big march. Uh, and that, that's quite amazing to realize that it's not just that he's doing this sort of energetically uh, and unseen, but he actually is there in the marches. Yes, he is there. And uh, many people who've been to marches can uh, share their experience of in the middle of all of this uproar, it seems, there's peace, there's sanctity, there's a sense of, of uh, tranquility. And it, it's so surprising uh, for many people who've reported that. And I just wanted to mention the word invincible, Sabina, because uh, now at, with organized, um, you know, directed people, uh, the master through Benjamin Krem said that that a voice of the people, those protests, the people who participate are invincible. So that means a lot. You know, what, what does it mean to be invincible in this world where you feel powerless? And uh, that is what is happening. The voice of the people is growing. World public opinion is being structured upon that. And change is coming as a result of the insistence of the people for change. That's right. And um, I guess the only thing really that I can add to that is to say that I'm sure most of us feel it within ourselves. We, we experience some kind of a, a quickening, something in us that's different from say 10 years ago uh, in the past, a, a sense of possibility, a, a sense also of hope. Uh, and, and I think when you talk about the fact that governments have to concede at the end of the day when there's sufficient uh, public protest and demand, I think this is something more and more people realize is, is actually true. Uh, yeah. And it's not just a, a, a kind of a fantasy or, or a, a dream. Uh, so that's a very big change. And, and I like the fact that um, Benjamin Krem's master talks about how the people uh, clear eyed and unafraid have mm. looked into the future and seen the possibility of the fulfillment of their aspirations for a just and peaceful world. That's from another article by mm -hmm. Benjamin Krem's master, uh, clear eyed and unafraid. Yes. And I think that's what we're seeing. We're seeing a growth in knowledge and more and more people are able to access information about how things work, uh, how the powers that be are actually running things. Mm -hmm. And it's, once you have this knowledge and you see what these structures are and how they work, uh, that allows you to be unafraid because there's not just a vague dread, but you actually know what you're up against. Exactly. But in, it, it, as a part of all of our activity, we have our coming to this level of unity, which the age of Aquarius brings us to, you know, from that level of synthesis, unity can come. Um, I want to just mention that I, we have the word, uh, the, something from what Maitreya has said, or the master said that Maitreya will undermine the need uh, for unity in all our undertakings and synthesis. So we talk about how, you know, how the masters are here to help us. But in addition, they have help from their higher sources. The avatar of synthesis um, does uh, overshadow Maitreya and help him. The spirit of peace and equilibrium. These are all uh, it, uh, help uh, agents of assistance that Maitreya is drawing on and passing uh, the results of their uh, participation on to us as we choose. You know, Maitreya is not forward in the, in the world yet. He's, we don't know him. Uh, we know of him. So our goal is to realize that 
These are legitimate uh, qualities that we can aspire to, that we have the ability to change what is happening in front of our eyes. It's up to us. And when we choose it, not when we sometimes go and sometimes not, or, you know, sometimes we criticize people that are doing these quotes, outlandish things or not. But once we choose to move the society forward and not remain in the stagnant Piscean ways of, of uh, greed and, uh, you know, corruption, then Maitreya can step forward. And he also talks about the fact that we need to find an identity of purpose. And I think that's a very powerful idea because in order to solve our problems, when we can coalesce around a purpose, a shared purpose, when we agree mm -hmm. on a purpose, that's when we really have an, an augmented power. And I think that's what we've seen with these movements, the most recent uh, movements of change and, and the desire for change is that there has been this uh, unity around a purpose and, and it gives tremendous force to what people are asking for. Right. And in that case, we're putting, as it says here, our individualities, who we become at the service of the group, that is to serve, to help others elevate, you know, to elevate them in their life on earth and in their ev the evolution of consciousness. And Maitreya also says that, um, or sorry, Benjamin Krem's master says that men will come to appreciate and value the richness of the achievements of themselves and others. And I think that's very important as well because it's easy to perhaps miss how important these achievements are. Uh, but I think that the masters and Maitreya are going to be able to, in a way, awaken us to seeing things perhaps in a, in a proper perspective, to really understanding how, how much we're, we're doing and how valuable it is. And I think that's also, a a great power to when you see that. Yes, it is. Want to share? Sorry, go so, ahead. So, so the basic, uh, this is to me a basic paragraph of information uh, that Maitreya has presented for us to understand. Without sharing, there can be no justice. Without justice, there can be no peace. And without peace, there can be no future. That means we're confronted with an ultimatum that, you know, you're pretty close to the brink here. And we're here to help you step back as if, it, as if the masters of wisdom are thinking. And so we need to take advantage of this help and not continue in the ways that are not best for the majority of the people on the planet. Well, and I have seen signs in, in photos of protest marches that say uh, no justice, no peace. So I think this idea is engaging many people's minds. And we've talked about this previously. Uh, I Googled how much it would cost to end world hunger one day. Mm -hmm. And when I wrote how much would it cost, the first suggestion that, that came up that Google gave me was end world hunger. And I did a little bit of investigation to find out if that was just me or it was happening for others as well. Turned out it was happening for others as well. And so we've concluded that the problem of sharing is on people's minds. Um, I'm sure millions of people are aware of the need for sharing. And so I think that we're, we're heading in the right direction. And Maitreya himself has said that he has no doubt of the outcome. Mm -hmm. that it, if he believes that we're going to do the right thing, we're going to uh, demand sharing and, and actually institute sharing on a global level, then I think I, I trust that, that that actually is going to happen, as amazing it is, as it may seem. But if you look back, you'll see that many times in history, things happen that seemed impossible just the mm -hmm. day or week or the year before. Uh, we often talk about how the end of apartheid in South Africa was one of those. The Berlin Wall coming down. Yes, indeed. And I wanted to add to what you said. Um, I read a public policy person, um, an expert in public policy, said that using only 12% of the 1917 tax cut, poverty could be eliminated in the US. 
Well, that's tremendous. Well, and that, and that in the news today, I'm seeing articles about uh, ProPublica has revealed recently, um, just in the last few days, how little tax uh, the 25 richest people have paid. Uh, yeah. I, think, I don't remember if it was the 25 richest in the world or in the United States, but the demands are now being made for an increased tax on wealth. And since the G7 is meeting right now, it's actually a topic. Uh, and so this looks like something that's going to come about. And that, that would make a great change in terms of yes. sharing. Yes, it certainly would help so many people. And we wanted to talk a little bit more about Maitreya just to say that uh, in addition to being sort of the, the elder brother of the elder brothers or the head of the spiritual kingdom, he's also uh, the Christ. The, he holds the position of the Christ. Uh, and the Christ principle is love. And so out from Maitreya streams continuous unconditional love. And that love goes to every single one of us. He is aware of all of us and he is streaming that love to each of us. So we're actually living in a, a very unusual time in that we're able to be uh, receiving this love all the time. Uh, and because he's now li living on the earth in a physical body, like not just in a, in a mountainous retreat somewhere in a light body, but he's in a physical body, it means that this love energy that he's streaming towards us has much more potency. Uh, and I think that that's a tremendous thing to be aware of and that he's stimulating the energies of uh, the desire for change in people, as well as this love energy. It means we have a lot of support uh, in all of our activities, everything that we undertake. And that love affects everyone, you know, in all um, ways and all standards and, st and stations in life. And so those who are not um, so interested in the idea of sharing and, and refuse to cooperate are also being stimulated by this love. So we see the big dichotomy, people taking, seeing the difference, seeing the options. There's either we go this way or we go that way. And they're, they're taking sides, making a choice. And Maitreya's priorities are very, very much in line with what we were talking about earlier, the uh, Article 25 of the uh, UN Declaration of Human Rights, the absolute essentials for, for human life, since we all are living in physical bodies and we must sustain our bodies. So correct food and water, um, safe, adequate housing, and then education, healthcare. These first four are absolutely fundamental. And it, I'm sure in, in the future, when we look back, it will seem really insane that these uh, were not ensured for every single person on, on the earth. The fact that it's not a, a sure thing that everybody has correct food and water, how can that possibly be? It seems really, well, it's just, uh, well, it's a sign of how, how skewed and how uh, distorted our, our current systems are. And the last two, healing the planet and removing guilt and fear. So by healing the planet, of course, many things have to be done to uh, eliminate pollution and to restore, um, you know, uh, the plant life that has been used inappropriately and the animal life as well. But finally, I think Maitreya is unique in his ability through the agency of love to remove guilt and fear, which is wonderful. It means you get a fresh start. Right. So, he teaches, sorry, he teaches the art of self-realization, which is a very simple method. We've talked about it previously, and I'm sure we'll talk about it again mm -hmm. uh, for people to come into contact with their essential self uh, and experience what you're describing, a new start. Mm -hmm. And it's said that in countries, there are just a very few of them that have these um, ideas in place that everyone needs um, safety, it needs food, needs education, that's provided rather than have people struggle for it by the government, that there's a sense of peace, there's a sense of uh, tranquility, there's a sense of of fearlessness and safety. Well, I experienced it when I lived in Norway for a decade or so. Uh, when I first got there, I was struck by something that I couldn't quite put my finger on. And then I realized 
with time that I was experiencing a quality of security and trust mm -hmm. in the population and that I think it stems from their increased um, social security net and uh, their increased taxation so that people experience a, a quality of peace because they know that their lives are being taken care of if they have a problem. I mean, everybody has jobs, uh, people work and, and pay taxes just as we do here, but I, I think they pay more taxes proportionally. Mm -hmm. And so the social security system is, is stronger and is able to provide more for people when they need it. Uh, and that makes a very big difference. Absolutely. Once you're committed to what it takes, then this can be done with no one having to uh, eliminate their bank account. No, that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about basically sharing the resources of the world so that every person, no matter where they are on the planet, will have these, uh, these benefits, food, housing, education, and uh, social security. And we have a little quote here from Greta Thunberg, the young climate activist, who has said the same things, basically, that people are starting to find their voice and realize that they have an impact and that people don't want to just carry on business as usual. Uh, it's a topic in the news these days about the sort of the end of the restrictions caused by the pandemic mm -hmm. and everyone saying, are we going to return to business as usual? And and there's a large chorus of voices saying, no, we don't want to do that. Uh, we don't want to carry on the way we have been. We want change. Exactly. And it's so critical that these problems of mankind are real and solvable. The solution lies within our grasp, your grasp. If you take the, your brother's need, as Maitreya is saying in this message, as the measure for your action and solve the problems of the world, not leave it alone. We say, oh, eventually, oh, there've always been poor people in the world. That's not ten uh, tenable anymore. There is no other course except to solve these problems. And um, we have something interesting here. Uh, Erica Chenoweth, a professor of public policy at Harvard, uh, did studies on previous um, civil resistance movements uh, where change resulted. And what she found was that it may only take 3.5% of the population uh, to topple a dictator, for example, with civil resistance. So the proportion of a population who needs to be actively engaged is actually quite low, much lower, I think, than most of us think. So this also is very heartening uh, to realize that it's not that you need the entire population to be actively uh, out on the streets. Mm -hmm. uh, but it, in terms of working for change, it may be simply a small group who, who actually produces the change if they are supported by the, the large majority. Uh, people often talk about the silent majority. Mm -hmm. And I think that there's, there's a real, uh, power in that silent majority if they start to use their voice and, and say, yes, we agree with this, and this is also what we want. Or the critical mass, you can also think of it in terms of that antiquated term. And just another message that's reiterating what we've already said, um, understanding and courage go hand in hand. Uh, the fact that the master, Benjamin Krem's master and Maitreya they so so much of what they talk about has to do with the need for change, how to bring the change about, um, the fact that we have help in doing so in a way. And I think this is often perhaps surprising to people to think of a spiritual master or somebody who has great wisdom uh, advocating in a way revolution, uh, advocating change on this scale and on this kind of level. Uh, but, but if you really take, for example, the teachings of uh, Jesus in the New Testament, if you look at, at what he was talking about, uh, see your brother as yourself, well, then you realize, or, or see your sister as yourself, see each other as, as oneself, then you realize, well, obviously, the, the necessary result of that, if you really do that, is that in the face of the world we currently live in, you, you will become a revolutionary uh, you will want change. Uh, so it's, if you really follow the logic, it's, it's not surprising. But I think that perhaps 
we often end up with an image in our minds of what wisdom is or what um, some type of spiritual teacher would be like. Uh, but I personally find it very inspiring that the masters say these things and tell us, yes, go forth and bring about this change. It's necessary. And the um, revolution we're talking about is really evolution. That is only through nonviolent civil disobedience can these things be accomplished. As we've seen in some of the uh, protests a year ago, there is, uh, you know, they, the, the protests were interrupted by violent elements. And we don't know where they came from, apparently. And so uh, once uh, we can uh, commit to evolution and, uh, and to nonviolence, only nonviolence, this can move forward much more quickly. That's right. Um, and as we were saying earlier, uh, this, the new superpower really is <clears throat> world public opinion. And one of Maitreya's, uh, one of the things he does, Benjamin Krem has said, is it, it's part of Maitreya's work to stimulate and educate the people to demand their rights. And so really that is the revolutionary aspect of all this, I think. Maitreya has also said everyone is needed. No one is too small or young to take part in this great plan for the rescue and rehabilitation of our world. So it's really a call to, to action for everyone, every single one of us. Yes, it is. And as you were saying, this is about evolution. So I've used the word revolution, but revolution in the sense of change, not in the sense of violence. Right. Uh, evolution, the growth, the constant and ongoing growth of, of each one of us, uh, I think leads to the inevitability of needing change and needing uh, to replace a, a system that doesn't allow people to evolve and grow with right. something that does that supports that evolution and growth. Excellent, I certainly agree with you. And we have a, a, just another quote here from someone else, Margaret Mead. And this is from quite some time ago in the, in the 70s. And she was pointing out that the only thing that's ever changed the world is thoughtful, committed citizens. And Yvonne, you talked about um, the work in the 30s in the United States uh, mm. by, by unions, labor unions, yes. uh, women's suffrage, the civil rights movement. So we can look back in time and we can see examples of this. Yeah. And perhaps what's different nowadays is that this the thoughtful, committed citizens are are no longer a small group. Uh, they're everywhere in the world. I would also add abolitionists, if I just may um, say the word. Um, and as Margaret Mead says, indeed, it is the only thing that ever has changed the world. So from her level, 1978, she saw it as a, as a visionary, I would say, anthropologist and activist. Right, and um, very recently, The Guardian uh, Weekly published this uh, edition saying that the, the previous decade was the decade of protest. Mm -hmm. And yes, yes it, it has been. And I think we're entering another decade, which will be uh, the same and even more uh, so the people power, the will and voice of the people will become the guiding light of all countries and nations, says Maitreya. Almost without exception, the master says, the nations of the world are caught up in a new experience, the emergence of the articulate masses. And in a way, it, 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 it needed the internet. It needed uh, the type of access to information that we now have for mm us, the regular people, the masses, to become articulate because we needed to have access to information, to knowledge, and mm -hmm. to be able to share with each other ideas. Uh, this is something that was not imaginable even 30, 40 years ago, before the internet, before the age of the internet, uh, the internet accessible to the public, not just the military internet. Um, I don't think we could imagine it. I know that when I was growing up, uh, we didn't have the internet, we didn't have uh, mobile phones. Mm -hmm. And if you wanted, <clears throat> excuse me, if you wanted information, you had to go to the library. 
or maybe if you were lucky, you had a book at home about something. But of course, there was always a time lag because anything you would read in a book was already out of date because it had been published previous to you holding the book in your hands. Um, and the whole process of book production and publication always takes time. Uh, and so you were never up to date in the way that you are now. Of course, we had TV and radio, we had the news, but that was one source giving out information and there was no alternate. There was no other way to find out what was happening or to find out if what they were saying on the news was true or accurate. So I think this has made such a great difference in our ability to be informed and to share with each other our ideas and to gather together our forces. From the encyclopedias to the internet. Yeah, really, it's, a, it's an incredible change. It really is. It yeah. is. And we'd like to now kind of wrap up this section, and we're going to do uh, 30 minutes of transmission meditation, uh, a meditation that Benjamin Krem introduced to the world, and it's a meditation for the age of Aquarius. It's a, it's a group meditation. And we'll just briefly re return to our sources, uh, share-international.org, and the YouTube channel, Share International, and for books and downloads, share-ecart.com. Four books are available for free download, which uh, give quite a good grounding on this topic. And in, you'll notice there's also one of them called Transmission, a meditation for the new age. So if you're interested in this meditation, you can read up about it uh, for free. And there's also a magazine called Share International, with no advertising, supported by subscribers only. And at share-ecart.com, you can get more information about how to subscribe. And this magazine does something similar to what we do here every week, which is it, it links the appearance or the return of the masters of wisdom and Maitreya to the world, to the everyday world, with current events, uh, what's happening in the world right now for all of us. And so transmission meditation, um, Yvonne, do you want to describe it a little bit? Well, it's not anything new. Um, transmission meditation was given to Benjamin Krem uh, in 1974. And from that point, it's been used in the world. I think six years earlier, transcendental meditation had been uh, given as a personal meditation. But transmission is a group meditation. Uh, it requires three or more. And it is uh, easy in that we simply hold our attention here at the chakra, as we say, between the brows. And that uh, allows us, that's elevated awareness, as it were, to be available to the level of, of masters who are, are masters of, of science as well, to, um, with our permission, having sat down and said, I'm going to do transmission meditation to pass through energies from many areas uh, through our chakras. These are cosmic energies, which normally simply bounce off humanity. But when they're stepped down through our chakra system, they go out into the world. And I think only from the, I think it's the upper chakras ending with the solar plexus into the world for good. So, so basically you're saying when we sit down to meditate, um, we're actually doing something in collaboration with the masters of wisdom, uh, because one of the things they do is they direct these energies that are entering our earth from, from beyond the solar system, that is other stars, not just our sun. And these energies that enter our, our solar system and our earth are very potent, very uh, helpful, they stimulate growth and awareness, but they are not absorbable by the vast majority of people. We cannot absorb these energies because they are vibrating at such a high rate. So when we sit to meditate, we are agreeing to allow these energies to enter us and flow through our chakras. And, and in the process of doing that, they are reduced in their um, vibrational rate, their step down. <clears throat> and so as they flow out of us again, they now are absorbable and the masters can send them where they're needed. So Yvonne, again, we, we don't send the, 
the energies anywhere. We simply allow this natural process to take place. And sometimes you're, you're not aware of any feeling or energy coming through, but the, it's happening uh, no matter whether you feel um, energy coming in or see or anything, um, it's happening automatically. So it's, a, it's an act of service. That's the difference uh, between transmission meditation and other meditations. It's a karma yoga and it's a laya yoga, which involves service as well as um, tuning your own chakras in the process. So that very much uh, progress can be made in one's um, evolutionary journey through the uh, practice, regular practice of transmission meditation with a group. And we also want to mention that during this time of pandemic, uh, people have begun to meditate together using Zoom to connect uh, since they can't go and meet each other in a, in a locale uh, to sit together. So we've got the chat. Uh, in the chat, there are links to these Zoom meditation groups. So you're welcome to join them if you're interested. Uh, as Yvonne was saying, it's a very simple meditation. We just put our attention at the Ajna Center and hold it there. If you notice your attention wandering, you say OM mentally, not with your voice, but just in your mind. And that will bring your attention back to this spot. And then you'll be back in the meditation. Yvonne, you also said people often don't feel anything. They're not aware of any kind of energy. And this is true. People vary in their awareness of energies. Uh, people's bodies are different. Uh, different types of physical bodies have different capacity or, or sensitivity to energies. So some people do feel energies and others don't. Uh, if you don't feel anything, it doesn't mean the meditation is not happening. Uh, the other thing, Yvonne, that you mentioned was the quality of service in this meditation. But it's also true that you will help your own evolution when you do this meditation. It, it has a great impact on a person's own process of personal evolution. So there, it's a win-win situation in a way. And we just want to briefly say you don't need to believe in anything to do this meditation. You don't even have to believe in energy or in Maitreya, the masters, or, or anything, really. Uh, just try the meditation and see. You'll, you'll experience for yourself if there is something there for you. Um, I knew a fellow who used to come and meditate regularly who didn't believe any of the things we've been talking about. He didn't believe in the masters. He didn't believe in Maitreya, but he loved the meditation. So he came and he did it every week. And he was serving humanity in that process. He was. And, and it's free. Of course, it's always free. Uh, it's, it's not any, it's not anything that people will ask money for. Uh, and you can just start your own group with, uh, two friends. So you, you can join a group that already exists, or you can do it with others, uh, in your home or in your circle of friends who, who are interested. And, um, the other thing that we haven't mentioned is the great invocation. This is how we start the meditation. We say this invocation together in unison. It's, it's a great mantra. It's been translated into many languages around the world. There are transmission groups all over the world. And for the purposes of today, when we're doing this over Zoom, uh, I think, Yvonne, you're going to say the great invocation. Yes, I will. And, yeah, I'll mute out and I'll say it here where I'm sitting, but nobody else will hear it. And I encourage everyone to say it wherever they are so that we say it together. This is a way of letting the masters know that we're ready to begin. And uh, we're actually calling for these energies to stream forth. And we will meditate today for 30 minutes. I'll set my timer. Okay. At the end of the 30 minutes, we will uh, end our broadcast. We'll say goodbye. And um, yeah, I guess that's it. Is there anything else that we should mention that we haven't said? Well, we just hope you take this information with you, consider it, you know, uh, and, and use it. Right. Okay, I've set my timer for 30 minutes, so I'll mute out and you just go ahead, Yvonne. All right. From the point of light within the mind of God, let light stream forth into the minds of men. Let light descend on earth.
from the point of love within the heart of God. Let love stream forth into the hearts of men. May Christ return to earth. From the center where the will of God is known, let purpose guide the little wills of men. The purpose which the masters know and serve. From the center, which we call the race of men, let the plan of love and light work out. And may it seal the door where evil dwells. Let light and love and power restore the plan on earth.
And that was 30 minutes. Uh, it, it passes in a flash and uh, you don't realize how much time has passed when you're doing this meditation. Uh, so thank you everybody for being here. And uh, we'll be back again next week with Dick Larson to talk more about the reappearance of the masters and Maitreya, of, and, Maitreya. and um, Yvonne will be back with us in about a month on the 17th of July. So have a good week, everybody. Happy Saturday and hope to see you again. Bye-bye.